Electricast. The views, assumptions, and opinions expressed by the Geo Godfather hosts, guests, and callers on the program are strictly their own and do not necessarily represent the opinions or beliefs of Electricast Media. More than ever, we have to make sure that we don't run into a humanitarian crisis, definitely not a humanitarian disaster. We have to take into account what measures are necessary in order to make sure that the war doesn't become a regional war, that Iran and Hezbollah, Houthis, and other elements in the Middle East don't force us to fight more wars simultaneously beyond what we are already fighting anyhow, in the, especially in the north, but also vis-a-vis the Houthis in Yemen. So uh, all of these elements should come into the calculations, into the calculus of our way of fighting. Welcome to the Geo Godfather Wars, the real talk on understanding how geopolitics impacts you and your world. We're your hosts, Barak Sina, and I'm Leah Tedro. Thank you for joining us as we take a deep dive behind the topics affecting the world we live in today. Welcome back to the show, where we'll be discussing the war in Israel in a four-part series. Today, we continue with part two, the new rules of engagement in our series. Here, we're going to be exploring how Israel initially engaged in combat with Hamas, the unique difficulties specific to this conflict, and where that leaves us today. Later in the show, we'll be joined by our special guest, former Brigadier General Yossi Cooperwasser, former Director General of the Israel Ministry of Strategic Affairs, as he discusses the tactical and operational approach to engaging Hamas, the challenges that Israel is facing in executing those strategies, and how Israel is spearheading a next-generational mode of warfare. Our usual segments of what this means to you and who's who in The Godfather, where Barack will so kindly discuss which countries are emulating the traits of the characters from The Godfather, will follow as per usual. Barack, how are you? It's, uh, we keep having these sporadic meetings. It's sort of like here, there, and everywhere. Your life is like taking over our recording schedule. Vice versa, look, life. (laughs) It's, you know, it's like living fast and time flies and I've not even been having much fun. Okay, so with that, I think we should just jump right into the fact that this is a really interesting conflict because it's very unlike previous conflicts. And I wouldn't say that Israel has its hands tied behind its back. I would say that they are operating under unusual parameters when trying to combat against a terrorist group, which in this case is Hamas. The strange sort of measures they're having to take, which I don't disagree with to try and minimize collateral, but it's giving Hamas a huge advantage over Israel by the fact that Israel is having to broadcast its movements by virtue of trying to reduce human casualties. Look, um, I was speaking yesterday to uh, the renowned historian Lord Andrew Roberts, who had co-authored a book with General Petraeus uh, entitled Conflict. And he was basically expressing that what Israel is doing is quite unprecedented, that if there have been 15,000 Palestinians killed, of which 5,000 of them have been combatants, Hamas combatants, then that hit rate is one in three, which he said was the most remarkable hit rate that has ever been seen in conflict. And I just find it quite ironic when Israel is held to a different standard to anybody else from the international community, whether they've been fighting uh, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, etc. And what I think is also, I'm quite critical of the way Israel is conducting Uh, warfare, but for the opposite reason that many others are. I just find it a kind of Monty Python-esque style of fighting when you've got initially the IDF giving heads up to Hamas by simply dropping lots of leaflets, uh, sending out millions of texts, saying in advance where they plan to be striking in order to avoid civilian casualties. And then what happens is Hamas ends up moving its assets, it incentivizes them to take human shields, and then on top of that, Israel will drop dummy bombs to ensure that civilians should get out of the way of certain buildings. Um, And it's just not the way to fight a war. A war is a tragic 
environment whereby civilians are going to get killed. That's the tragedy of warfare. But if you're going to fight a war, fight a war and don't give your enemy the initiative to move its assets and target you from other places. No, I don't disagree with you, but I think I I have to say that Israel is doing all they can to minimize the civilian casualties, which have been enormous because of how densely populated Gaza is um, and the fact that Hamas is hiding within, you know, residential communities, schools, hospitals. And when they do get warning, um, you know, I've seen several of the Palestinian people on various different news programs saying Hamas has blocked us from leaving. They won't let us leave. Um, they won't let us leave the hospitals. They've wrote, blocked the roads. And then also you have a lot of, I think, sort of, inflated numbers of civilian casualties, uh, you know, coming out of Gaza. And I think currently, I think it's about 16,000 uh, casualties of civilians. And that's, I think, what it, the Israeli government is accepting as the number of casualties currently in Gaza. You know, so it, it is a large number for such small countries. That is a large number of casualties. But I think one thing that people tend to forget is that Israel isn't the perpetrator of this. And what I mean by that is that this was started by Hamas, you know, and Hamas is the reason why Israel is having to respond this way because of the abhorrent attacks lodged against innocents in Israel on October 7th. And I think we're sort of mixing and matching and they're all kind of blending together. And it's interesting to me that a country that is defending itself is being held to account to a higher degree than a recognized terrorist organization. Um, I think that there is no doubt that, first of all, anti-Semitism would be a contributing factor to that. I mean, Andrew Roberts yesterday was speaking about how the UN is inherently an anti-Israel organization. And as a result of that, would not be able to be trusted for the day after to actually develop infrastructure and take stewardship. Let me ask you a question. Um, Where does that anti-Semitism come from? Because, I mean, we all live our lives and we go on, you know, with our daily lives. And I know you know, the anti-Semitism is still out there, but there has been a rise in anti-Semitism over the last decade. And there seems to be now everything is kind of bubbling to the surface of this sort of like latent anti-Semitism. And I'm just curious as to where does that come from? How is that still a thing? And I don't mean that in an ignorant, naive way. I'm just saying, where where does that stem from? I think it's uh, the classical anti-Semitism from time immemorial that just mutated. As Martin Luther King said, that when they say, um, I hate Israel, what they really mean is Jews. And the irony of Zionism is that it enabled anti-Semitism to mutate from an ethnic to national level. So today, people don't say, I hate Jews. If they're intelligent, they'll say, I hate Israel, or they will demonize Israel, hold Israel to a different, a disproportionate standard. They'll disproportionately criticize Israel or hold Israel to a double standard. So it's something which is deep-rooted. You've got whole departments and universities addressing this, and it's just an ancient scourge of humanity. However, I think it is a truth that when you saw the attack on the Al-Shifa hospital, by Islamic Jihad initially, people were condemning Israel vehemently for conducting genocide by targeting a hospital. When they found out that afterwards it wasn't the IDF that had done that, but Islamic Jihad had done that, they were frustrated. First of all, they didn't condemn the Islamic Jihad, the Islamism, the nihilistic nature of the suicidal form of terrorism. They kept silent and they were frustrated because they wanted it to have been Israel. They wanted the Jews to have perpetrated this type of attack. So that's not any more ignorance. That's willful ignorance. But that plays into exactly their narrative, right? That plays into the the Hamas charter. It's what they want. You know, it plays right into exactly the sentiment they're trying to drive, right? And, you know, that demonstrates the suicidal nature of anti-Semitism because ultimately jihad has global impulses for domination. It's not a regional, territorial specific impulse. And so therefore, to a great degree, Western liberals are digging their own graves by empowering 
Islamism because jihad will be coming to a cinema near them very soon. Well, I mean, one of the Hamas leaders uh, was giving an interview uh, in the last couple of days where he said we need to perpetrate as many attacks against American and British targets as possible, right? This isn't an isolated sort of mandate, I think. You know what I mean? I think they're moving further afield, right? But it's this, what's dangerous is this willful ignorance to identify the fact that Israel is just on the front lines of global jihad, that this is not ending with the Jews. It starts with the Jews, but it goes global. Yeah, I think this leads to, you know, the stuff that we actually talked about last time is that Israel um, is losing the sort of strategic communications game. Um, They've not really been focused on that globally. They don't really know their story. But also, they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place as well. I mean, when we spoke with Dr. Vera on our last episode, you know, she was talking about the fact that she was a huge proponent of Israel staking its claim as a good ally and, you know, getting involved in Ukraine. And there were a lot of reasons Israel cited of not getting involved, and not least of which was they were afraid for the safety of Russian Jews in Russia and in Ukraine and Syria, and there was a whole host of things. So I think it's a difficult position, I think, for Israel to be in because it's very complicated, this wire balancing act that they have to do to maintain allies and favor and keep the sort of balance of peace at home, which has just been completely blown out the window now, you know, with this conflict. But I think it is, it's more to the fact that I think, to your point, that they are being held to an unusual standard. I mean, this is not something the U.S. or the coalition forces were asked to do when they went into Iraq or Afghanistan or any of those things, right? You see, I spoke to Andrew Roberts about this very point, and he said, look, it's unprecedented during a conflict for any Western army to establish a humanitarian corridor, humanitarian zones, humanitarian pauses. That doesn't happen during conflict that may happen after a conflict but not during one and so it is affecting the way israel is conducting its conflict but here is the irony um the first thing is israel needs to win this war very quickly it does not have the luxury of time because the court of uh, international opinion is turning against them it's turned against them already dramatically and so It starts with focusing on the north, giving Hamas heads up when it's going to attack, right? Allowing Hamas to move its assets. So that complicates things. Then afterwards, it tells the civilians to move south. Yichia Sinwa, the architect of the massacre, he moves south in a humanitarian convoy with many, many other Hamas operatives into more densely populated areas, far more densely populated than the north, then Israel has the challenge subsequently of targeting these operatives in a more densely populated environment. Then Israel decides to create humanitarian zones, assuring the Palestinians that Israel is not going to be at all targeting these humanitarian zones. So obviously Hamas operatives go to these humanitarian zones and start firing rockets on Israel from those zones. So and in the meantime, this is what the irony is. It extends the conflict, extends the scope, it extends the duration of the conflict, at which point it leads to international opinion to be more critical of Israel, ironically, by Israel attempting to mitigate civilian casualties. So, you know, if you're going to fight a war, fight a war. But in that breath, the civilian casualties have been extraordinary this time. I mean, each recorded fatal Israeli airstrike in Gaza since the 7th of October has caused an average of 10.1 civilian deaths, you know, and that's according to Action on Armed Violence, and said... The higher figure this time implied that there had been a notable change in Israel's targeting approach, although the figure is still lower than recent battles in Iraq and Syria. But the fatality average is far higher than in the three previous Israeli air campaigns in Gaza, of which the most deadly was Operation Protective Edge in the summer of 2014, where the equivalent figure was 2.5. 
And you're seeing more and more reports of this where they're saying that it's been disproportionate. I mean, Anthony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, on Friday said that far too many Palestinians had died and more needed to be done to protect lives. And more to your point, he's asking for more humanitarian pauses. But, I mean, the casualty figures are extraordinary this time. But, first of all, every place that has reported these casualties that you've mentioned, what happens is, first of all, it's not corroborated. Secondly, it's relying on Hamas statistics. In previous conflicts, we've identified subsequently that the number of civilians that Hamas is referring to is including many Hamas terrorists that have been killed. Third, but this is also, this is independent. It, this isn't it, from Hamas. This is an independent group that's coming up with these numbers. Yeah. But it's relying on Gaza's Ministry of Health Statistics. That are, but it's not. They're going and they're taking it from news reports from both Israel and from Gaza. And they've said it's based on media reports of 276 airstrikes that caused fatalities. A total of 2,798 Palestinians were reported to have been killed in the incidents, monitored, and a further 1,306 were injured. I mean, these are independent results, right? But it doesn't make sense because if there's a kind of similarity between Hamas and well, we know um, Hamas is lying. We know they're inflating the numbers. No, no, no. But if if we know that on average there is 15,000 deaths and 5,000 have been Hamas operatives, then it's as Andrew Roberts said, it's one to three. So I just to be honest, I genuinely do not understand these alternative stats that are thrown at us. They're just not corroborated. But it's very difficult. You've got two sides that, you know, are how do we verify other than reporters going in and, and counting bodies? Here's the question. Is this a case of an NGO fostering fake news? Because even The Guardian and The New York Times were saying these numbers haven't been corroborated. This, it, so this article... Uh, from The Guardian says the average numbers reported killed per casualty causing airstrike is lower than seen in two other major urban battles in the Middle East, according to the AOAV. The capture of Mosul from the Islamic State by Iraqi and Western forces in March of 2007 led to the deaths of 20.7 civilians per recorded strike. And the Russian and Syrian government assault on Aleppo in 2016 was more deadly still, with an average of 22.9 fatalities. But the Guardian is corroborating 10.1 civilian deaths. So this is what I'm saying. It's like it's very difficult to see what we have. But we know that Israel's government, the Israeli government, has said they accept there have currently been 16,000 Palestinians killed as a result of this war. They've accepted that number, which is extraordinary. That's a lot. That's that's a lot. But then the context is all that we can rely on which is the fact that this is taking place in urban populated areas and Hamas is using human shields. So that's all that we can rely on. Mm. But this actually leads to another point, which is quite important to bear in mind, that Israel has actually... So first of all, Chris Parry, who uh, was a former NATO commander, he commented that even the munitions that Israel is using is different in that it explodes upwards as opposed to outwards to prevent civilian deaths. So he was actually noting on the Times radio the extraordinary measures that Israel is taking to avoid civilian casualties. But secondly, Israel's actually completely overhauled its manner of conducting warfare in that it's made it uh, digitally integrated, that suddenly now you've got this enhanced integration between how Israel is collecting intelligence, whether it be on the ground human intelligence, signal intelligence, intelligence from satellites, uh, cyber intelligence and air force surveillance, which is swiftly distributed to artillery, drone, air force, tank units and navy units that will actively and rapidly support maneuvering forces on the ground to reduce the friction that strikes can be conducted with minimum civilian casualties and minimum contact with the enemy. So actually this digital form of integrated collection of intelligence that is swiftly given to the commander or officer on the ground is eliminating the fog of war and 
it's minimizing civilian casualties. And an example of this was intelligence that came through to an IDF unit 401 that saw that it was about to be ambushed by Hamas. And this information came to the officer on the ground from an intelligence center far away through a targeting center, then to the Navy, which fired a dozen shells from a missile boat, killing these targets that were waiting to ambush IDF soldiers. So I don't think Hamas realized in advance when they conducted October the 7th that Israel's mode of warfare had advanced so rapidly. And this is something that um, other militaries around the world had will any, study. Yeah, but I don't think that they ever had any intention of a military victory. I don't ever think that was the case. I really don't. Um, I think they knew that there was no way they could win against Israel. And I think they were just doing this to incite violence, you know, get more people on side with them. Uh, it's, I don't think they're under any illusions that they're going to win this. And well, I, but it seems mental to me what, to, what to do that. What you're saying is quite poignant. Again, it demonstrates the nature of Hamas being a, a suicidal, nihilistic, terrorist organization. And, and it's, it's very similar to the Nazi party. Look, the Nazis could have won World War II. They had Britain on their knees. They decided to suddenly target uh, the Soviet Union because there were too many Jews there. You couldn't at all ignore that. So now suddenly the Nazis had to contend with both Soviets and allied forces. And ultimately, the Third Reich that was meant to last for a thousand years lasted for a bit over half a decade. And the culmination of Nazism was when Hitler committed suicide. This is all about being self-destructive. So the fact that for Hamas, an inducement for Hamas is death, is alien to the Western mind, where the inducement is material growth, success, opportunities, prospect, conquering territory. Um, Hamas, it's all about inviting death. So when you're actually quoting the statistics from The Guardian, when The Guardian is quoting that, that for The Guardian is a disaster. For Hamas, that's an inducement. Yeah, I mean, we go in our next episode, we really go and explore beyond the land grab and radicalization and those kind of things. And that's what we'll be exploring in our next episode. But I want to talk about the ceasefire. The ceasefire with Hamas, they ended up, we had a couple of extensions, last minute extensions, and in the end, they released 110 hostages, 86 Israelis, some with dual citizenship, and 24 foreign nationals. The militant group previously freed four captives in October, and Israel also said it rescued another hostage, a female Israeli soldier, during a Gaza ground operation. Now, for you, this is going back and talking about how the ceasefire during that period, Hamas used this to move its assets and it eroded Israel's intelligence during that period. And we've had a discussion, but I just want you to kind of expand on that. Look, when one of the prerequisites for um, the ceasefire is that Israel suspends its UAVs over Gaza, uh, that it ceased collecting intelligence during that period of time. So... You know, the reason why Hamas initially agreed to the ceasefire was because of the accumulation effect of the continual onslaught that led Hamas to be backfooted and thought, right, look, we need a ceasefire. We're willing to release a number of hostages. If this momentum, it doesn't continue and increase, then actually the initiative is given to Hamas and Israel has to start its intelligence aggregation all over again from the start. So it was strategically a very, very dangerous thing for Israel to do. On that note, I think we now need to move into our next segment and welcome our very special guest.
And now we're honored to have former Brigadier General Yossi Cooperwasser. He was the head of the research division in the Israeli Defense Force Military Intelligence Division, Director General of the Israel Ministry of Strategic Affairs, and who is now currently serving as the Senior Project Manager at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, specializing in the security dimensions of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yossi, welcome very much to the show. Yossi, do you want to start about the revolutionary way this war is being conducted? Well, you know, the, in, in warfare, the, the most important feature is that you have to adapt your way of fighting to the goal that you are trying to achieve and to the special context in which you are going to fight. And this war is, is unique because it's a war about destroying the, the enemy, defeating it to, to the extent that it will not be able to carry out any military or terroristic activity. And uh, because it, there's no way of surprising the enemy, the enemy knows that you are coming. You, you can't build on surprise. So we were surprised, but uh, we cannot surprise Hamas. Hamas has been preparing itself to this kind of war for ages, or 20 years or so. So uh, they are very well uh, in, in a high level of readiness to this uh, kind of war. Another specific uh, issue that we have to deal with is the fact that most of their precious assets are in underground facilities, especially extremely deep tunnels. So while we can uh, relatively easily take control of the overground territory, uh, it's quite challenging to deal with the underground part of Gaza. And on top of that, we have a special problem that there are 240 hostages taken by Hamas, and we have to take this into account when we plan our activities. So it's a really very unique situation, because if there were no hostages, we could have used much more air uh, strikes and things like that, because uh, you care less about the possibility that your hostages are going to be hit. With the situation that we are facing, we have to find a way to, to operate in a way that takes all these elements into account and also have to take into account the fact that we want to win this war and achieve the goals of destroying Hamas in Gaza and uh, releasing the hostages without forcing ourselves to fight in other arenas as well. And, uh, there is an ongoing attempt that we have to take into account when we fight to force upon us a ceasefire before we manage to reach the goals. So uh, in this game of the ceasefire, this uh, effort to force this ceasefire upon us, we have to uh, make sure something that comes to us in any case, but more than ever, we have to make sure that we don't run into a humanitarian crisis, definitely not a humanitarian disaster. And uh, we have to take into account what measures are necessary in order to make sure that the war doesn't become a regional war, that Iran and Hezbollah, Houthis and other elements in the Middle East don't force us to fight more wars simultaneously beyond what we are already fighting anyhow, in the, especially in the north, but also vis-a-vis -vis the Houthis in Yemen. So uh, all of these elements should come into the calculations, in the calculus of our way of fighting. I'll give you an example. In the beginning, the major target of our opponents was to deter us, to convince us not to start a ground incursion. Because they understood that once the ground incursion starts, that the fate of Hamas is uh, becoming questionable, whether they're going to be able to survive or not. So they were trying to tell us, look, if you carry out a ground incursion, everything is going to explode and uh, there are going to be wars in the north. Uh, Iran is going to intervene and God knows what. And the Americans were concerned about it. So this is another special issue that we have to take into account, the Americans' perspective. The Americans were worried about what happens if you start a ground incursion into Gaza. So what we did in order to overcome this decisive point was that we never started the ground incursion. Even though we are already deep into Gaza with the ground forces, we never declared the beginning of the ground incursion. We crawled into Gaza gradually so that at no point you could have said, oh, but the ground incursion has started. We started with a couple of raids that, uh, following the raids, we came back to Israeli territory. And then we carried out another raid and then another raid. And then on the third raid, we didn't bring the forces back. And this was actually the beginning of the ground incursion, but uh, without beginning the ground incursion in any point of time. 
So this was a plan that was working well in avoiding this need for uh, Iran and uh, Hezbollah to react to the beginning of the crown in Kerch. The other thing we did is uh, we surprised the enemy by not moving from where they expected us to move and creating a tactical surprise in spite of the fact that we couldn't develop a strategic surprise. And we keep surprising them. We, we managed to surprise them tactically again and again. Uh, for example, first of all, on the strategic level, we surprised them by adopting these goals because they thought that what Israel is going to do is repeat its previous reactions to this kind of uh, attacks by Hamas, but not attempt to take Gaza from their hands because nobody wants Gaza and because they, uh, they created this uh, impression that uh, any attempt to enter Gaza with ground forces is going to be so costly for Israel that uh, the price doesn't justify the effort. And in fact, what happened was that Israel decided to do that. They were very surprised. And that's why everything they do is now trying to, to convince us to come back to the line of thinking they thought should be adopted by Israel, give up on the idea of defeating Hamas entirely and uh, taking over Gaza. And secondly, what they learned from previous confrontations with us was that when we try to carry out a ground operation, we start from the east and move to the west. Because Gaza is a small strip stretching from south to north. And uh, most of the border that we have with Gaza is on the east, eastern part of Gaza. So they probably were expecting us there. But we did just the opposite. We came from the north and from the south, and uh, especially from the north, along the western side of Gaza. And we moved directly into the center of Gaza without crossing all the elements that they have developed as, as a major part of their defense on the eastern side of Gaza, in Sajaria, in these places, in Jabalia. And we found ourselves within two weeks in the center of Gaza with limited, very painful, of course, but quite limited casualty. Still a lot to go. It's not over yet. Uh, we may pay heavier prices in the future, but, but so far we did something they didn't expect in my mind. And we reached, you know, the most important headquarters they had, not by bombing them from the air because they believe that because they hide under uh, hospitals, uh, they will be immune and protected. We found a way to reach the hospital with ground forces and enter the hospitals and uh, search for them in the hospital with ground forces without hitting the uh, hospitals. They were totally surprised in my mind by that. They managed to run away, but they were totally surprised. So if you look at this uh, way of action, we surrounded them because we came from all directions, but we moved in the western part of the city and reached directly the center of town, the center of their forces and the center of the government. All the key locations were taken by Israel. I'm talking about the overground uh, facilities. Underground, we deal with the underground simultaneously with uh, dealing with the overground. We knew that they built an uh, underground city or underground strip. This was not a surprise. But finding the tunnels themselves and reaching them in order to hit them is taking a lot of time. And uh, it's going to take more time. Because uh, even if we have some information, some intelligence about the locations of the, of the tunnels, we need more time in order to locate the other entrances of the tunnels, shafts, and deal with them. The, the engineering uh, effort that is required in order to deal with these uh, tunnels is immense. It's unbelievable what strong underground capabilities these people have. And uh, whenever you look at uh, these underground uh, facilities, you ask yourself, how come we gave them all this cement? It's huge amounts of cement that were involved in building these underground facilities. And this was all or mostly coming from you Israel. See, can I just uh, interrupt you for a second? Because I think what I kind of wanted to speak yes. to you about is the unique complexities in this specific conflict that Israel faces. Um, because this isn't a conventional war by any means, as in like previous, you know, wars that we've been involved in, you've had the sort of international powers and the UN and the globe really united behind the fact that we're either fighting ISIS or we're fighting Al Qaeda. 
Hamas is not even listed as a terrorist organization in the UN. Um, it is for the United States and for the European Union. So you've got one issue there. You're then restricted to international law. You're restricted by the fact that people want you to have a ceasefire. You're restricted by the fact that the people that you're fighting against are using, you know, Palestinians as human shields. They're setting up military bases in hospitals and schools, and they're doing it to leverage an aggressive response from Israel. And so they they can then leverage that aggressive response, I think, against the world. I think, you know, recently there was a quote about, you know, that Elon Musk had said, and he said the goal of Hamas was to provoke an overreaction from Israel. They obviously did not expect to have a military victory, but they wanted to commit the worst atrocities they could in order to provoke the most aggressive response possible from Israel and then leverage that aggressive response to rally Muslims worldwide for the cause of Gaza and Palestine, which they have succeeded in doing. And I think Israel is going into this with not just their hands tied behind their back, but with their you know legs and feet bound as well, because you are so restricted in how you can respond and what you can do. Can you just talk about how do you operate and maneuver in an environment where you don't have 100% support from an international community and you're bound by so many restrictions and so many various different complications that really just narrows the focus of what you're even able to do within those parameters? Well, uh, I think Elon Musk was 100% correct in uh, understanding the logic of Hamas. That, that is totally true, but I think he doesn't understand us. The logic of Hamas is exactly as, uh, as you portrayed from Musk. Yes, that they try to use human shields and uh, turn it into uh, leverage in order to put more international pressure on, on Biden, President Biden, so that President Biden will come to Israel and say, well, how about a ceasefire? And uh, how about letting Hamas survive? Uh, that is uh, their goal. But Israel, first of all, is convinced that it's fighting along the, according to the rules of war. Israel is convinced that it's doing whatever is necessary to be done according to international humanitarian law. And uh, yes, there are civilians that uh, get hurt, but their numbers are going to be diminished considerably since we started the, the ground offensive, because we use much less the air, air attacks. And we reach every place with our ground forces, and uh, most of the places that we reach with our ground forces are already evacuated, because at the same time, we carry out a very big operation of convincing the population to move south, leave Gaza City, and move to the areas we have uh, designated as safer area. So those who want to hate Israel can uh, take their uh, information from Hamas and uh, do whatever they want uh, according to the Hamas information. Those who really want to know what's happening on the ground, uh, and I hope there are some people like that in the, in the West as well, and it's not easy because many of the source of information are uh, uh, using Hamas information as, as if it is some sort of true information, including some uh, British media. But those who really want to know the truth can find the truth and know that the population of Gaza is leaving the Gaza city. In the areas where we fight, there is only very few civilians. And, uh, and, uh, and actually, less and less Hamas terrorists are found over there as well. And in more and more of the places we reach, Hamas is leaving as their weapons fleeing, and fleeing does away. Does that not give greater opportunity for them to reconstitute? Yeah, of course, they flee. And, uh, and I guess some of them go into the tunnels and some of them uh, run away with the population that goes south. And they are... And they could be back. That's... Uh, and we, we saw even uh, yesterday some uh, two Islamic Jihad operatives that they, they want to move uh, weapons in a baby crib. So it's, uh, th this is what's happening. And we saw, we see where, where they hide their weapons. They hide the weapons in, the, you saw that probably in the bed of, uh, of a little girl and, uh, under which there were uh, rockets. And uh, they leave the place and they leave the weapons but, uh, in the house. Sorry, you saw that in, as they in, uh, flee, you're not fulfilling your objective of completely eliminating Hamas if they flee to the south no we, we shall get to the we shall get to the other side of her uh, if they flee we'll get them later on so yes they still have the option of fleeing and uh, we don't want them to do that but if they decide to leave the scene and uh, run away uh, these guys as uh, civilians 
thousands of civilians are moving south. It's very difficult to, when we don't stop them on the way south, there's, there's somebody within the, this uh, thousands that are moving the, along this uh, Salah uh, road is an ex uh, Hamas terrorist. We uh, we cannot know. You that, see, uh, I mean, if time. Hamas is not actually playing by the rules at all, you guys are having to play by the rules. You're very restricted in what you can actually do. Leah, we believe that uh, we can win this war playing by the rules. OK, you know, everybody tells us, please play by the rules. We don't know any other way uh, uh, to fight. But how no much more difficult does that make it for you? That's my point, is that they aren't, I, I you definitely like... are, but how how much more difficult is that making it for you? So, sorry, Yossi, I just, it makes it more difficult. I just want to build it... on sorry. Leah's question. And, you know, as we saw with Vietnam and Afghanistan, guerrilla warfare is asymmetric, and their main premise is that they're able to defeat stronger forces like US and Soviet militaries. Now, when the US fought ISIS in Mosul, it inflicted hundreds of thousands of civilian casualties. And in a sense, it circumvented that issue, and it was able to claim proportionality by actually inflicting mass civilian casualties. Do you feel that a different standard is being applied to Israel. Are you fighting with your hands tied behind your back? There is a double standard towards Israel, of course. There's always been a double standard towards Israel. But, uh, and we are fighting with uh, limitations. I wouldn't say that we fight with uh, our hands behind our back, tied our, behind our back. No, it's not. This is an exaggeration. We take the necessary steps. Look, we attacked from the air something like 14,000 targets. Nobody claimed, not even Hamas, claimed that any of these targets was the wrong target. The only time they said that we attacked the wrong target was, was the case of the El Ahali Ma'adamani hospital, in which they said Israel attacked the hospital and caused 500 casualties. And, uh, and everybody knows that it was not Israel, it was not the hospital, and there were no 500 uh, casualties. And this was the only, the only case in which they were able to claim that Israel attacked the hospital, it turned out it was uh, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad with a failed uh, launching of a rocket. That's uh, where we stand on these issues. Nobody claimed that the 14,000 targets we attacked were the wrong targets. Yes, there's ambiguity about the number of uh, casualties, civilian casualties that were caused by these uh, attacks. And uh, the Palestinians, Hamas actually gives all kinds of numbers that everybody takes because there are no other numbers and we don't know how many were uh, hit by, by, the, by these uh, attacks. But those who want to know the truth know that we did everything according to the rule, not because the international community is telling us to play by the rule. I hear uh, Biden and I hear everybody else. We do that because this is the way we yeah. fight. We, it's not a, uh, that our hands are tied yeah. behind our back. And uh, we are doing everything in order to avoid hitting civilians. And uh, yes, civilians are hit, but we are doing yes, everything right to I'd like to, to ask you, um, the IDF has gone into Gaza multiple times in the past, and so there was concerns that Hamas would already anticipate how the IDF would fight. And there's been a kind of revolution in the military doctrine, a revolution in integration warfare um, with human intelligence, sea, air force and surveillance, um, land forces, cyber intelligence that are all integrated uh, to rapidly distribute intelligence to the commander on the field. Can you amplify this, how um, the new fighting doctrine could actually inform foreign militaries in the future? Yes, so there are two elements in, in, in our way of fighting that are relevant that should be studied in the future. Also. The first one is that we have uh, integrated the intelligence into the force, the strategic level intelligence and tactical, of course, uh, level intelligence into the force so that the force itself gets all the information it needs at real time, at relevant time. And uh, we call it, uh, we do two things in this respect. One is called we call it in Hebrew, lohamam, that's uh, fighting that is based on intelligence. And we have, for that purpose, we have developed something called Adanin, Adan, which is uh, military intelligence for the deployed forces, so that they get the, the intelligence uh, in real time. We have people moving with them and giving them the information in real time. 
And because, you know, the kind of information we need in this kind of uh, asymmetric war is not where is the tank of the other side, but where is a small uh, target like a person that uh, pops out from a tunnel shaft. It's the uh, importance of intelligence in force protection is, is critical, and not only force protection, but also in uh, winning the war. I, by the way, employed it many, many years ago when I was uh, chief intelligence officer of our Central Command. In the beginning of the Central of the Second Intifada, this uh, concept was employed for the first time and was a good preparation. We were able to really warn everybody that if somebody is going to shoot at him, that he should know that somebody is going to shoot at him. That is the, the, the first change that we did. The second change that we did, that we employ in on the field, is the uh, very close cooperation based on this intelligence, but also based on the picture that the soldiers on the field see with the supporting uh, elements, both the artillery and the air force. We have uh, precise artillery and we have precise uh, air force, of course, precise uh, capabilities of the air force. So whenever the forces are locating or can identify a threat in front of them, they can call in the principle we did it in the past many times. But the uh, the way we do it now is so uh, industrial, I would say, that most of the targets and most of the threats are being handled by this combination of the ground forces and the air force and the artillery. And uh, sometimes it's also done by the support of the Navy, because we have some Navy capabilities along the shore. So it's uh, all of these uh, fire centers are working extremely well. And this is the major secret, I would say, behind the fact that we so far, touch wood, have much less casualties than one could have expected. And on the other hand, we managed to kill already, I think, something like 4,000 Hamas terrorists already. And uh, I don't even count the, the 1,000 that were killed during the operation that Hamas conducted in on October 7th. I think uh, the number that uh, they have suffered is, is much something around that. So you have to remember, they had something like 20,000 uh, terrorists fighting for them in, uh, when the war started. It's quite a big number of casualties that they suffer. And the fact that they don't have greater numbers is that they, as I said, uh, in most cases, they just don't fight a, a battle. They see their forces. They at most try to hit them from afar or go deep into yes, the I have a dance. question for you. We've, we've spoken very heavily, I think, through this entire conversation about kinetic warfare. And I just wanted to talk to you about the non-kinetic warfare that's happening in this conflict. And I think in this day and age, you know, the non-kinetic sort of communications, propaganda, influence campaigns that are being run are, you know, a huge portion of the outcomes on the battlefield these days. And I think I think it's fair to say that Israel is losing the informational battle space. I mean, you've said several times today, if somebody wants to know the truth, they can go and find the truth. Whereas the Palestinian message is being broadcast very readily. Whether it's true or not is a very different story. But Israel is not getting its version of events out there. They're not telling what's happened. They're not going into backgrounds. We know that the younger generations that are not Israeli or Palestinian that are living that every day don't know the history behind this conflict and everything that has happened that has led you know, up to this and what Israel has done to try to create the two state solutions and, you know, the multiple efforts to create peace and the infrastructure that Israel has given to Gaza and, you know, a variety of other things. But I think in this, Israel really is losing this battle. They are not putting out the right messages in the right moments, in the right time. I don't think they're educating people about what's happening. I think you know, what you've described about what you're doing kinetically, none of that is making that to the mainstream media. You're only seeing this lean and this slant towards the Palestinians. And I think getting behind that that slogan of free Palestine is easy, but I think most people don't realize that the undercurrent and the tone of that is eradicating Jews and Israel is a free Palestine. And I think most people do not realize that. They just see one portion of the story. I mean, what do you think Israel should be doing to really start gaining ground in the information, you know, sort of war space here. By the way, Leah, um, you know, just to echo your point, it was just reported that Israel's foreign ministry's budget for Hasbara, public diplomacy, was um, they've run out. Um, they've only been operating on 10% of what it allocates towards investing in tourism. 
So this would be the worst time for Israel's public diplomacy to actually not have a budget allocated. Absolutely. I mean, the thing is, they're losing the information battle space. They just are. Israel is not getting out, you know, the information they need. And the thing is, is that Hamas basically says, here's the parameters that we operate. Here's our charter. This is what we want you to say. This is the message. Get it out any way that you can. And I think Israel is like, you know, much like the the West in that we continue to lose the information war space is that it has to go through like a number of approvals and we have to go through and there's, you know, budgets that are allocated to this and they don't, I don't think fundamentally. And then when they do broadcast things, it is so far out of the realms of reality of being untrue that it's just written off. Israel loses credibility and then actually plays into the hands of Hamas by lending their sort of version of events more credibility. So yes, I'd be very interested to hear what you think should be done in this realm of the informational battle space. Well, first of all, I fully agree with both of you that this is a very important uh, battle space that, that has to be dealt with in, in a better way than, than Israel did until now. Uh, first of all, we are bound by the truth. So we we have to say the truth. We cannot invent all kinds of things without uh, being uh, able to validate them. And uh, so, for example, take the Lahali Madani Hospital story. It took us a couple of hours to come up with the truth uh, about what happened. We, the spokesperson of the uh, IDF was asked about it while it was happening, and he said, look, I have to check. And uh, that's, uh, that's the right thing to do in a situation like that. But for the Hamas, it was uh, able to say, 500 people got killed by an Israeli attack on a hospital. And uh, now go explain that uh, it wasn't us, and it wasn't the hospital, and uh, it wasn't 500 people. That's a something that is built in in the situation. That, uh, we, we cannot uh, behave as Hamas does. And uh, the other thing that uh, is playing against us is that most of the media centers that uh, provides the information from the field are either unprofessional or uh, they have a uh, tendency, an anti-Israeli tendency. Okay, that's, uh, uh, that's true of most of the mainstream media. Look, they, they, many of them, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about Al Jazeera, okay, that is uh, controlled by Qatar, owned by Qatar and controlled by Hamas, okay, that's, uh, I'm not talking about them, but take the BBC, how difficult it was for them to, to admit that it was not Israel that carried out the attack, and everything, that's, uh, they have this, uh, how difficult it is for them to even to refer to Hamas as a terror organization. That's uh, that but, they are owned by the sorry, British I think government. Actually you actually asking them. a question. Like, I do take your point when they found out that it wasn't Israel that bombed the hospital, but Islamic Jihad had done so. They were frustrated because they would have wanted it to have been Israel. That's the point. So, I think what Lee is really getting to the point is rather than actually reacting to the media to just convey your side, to strategically put your narrative out there to put your version of events out yeah, there we, and we do that. We, it could look. be in digital media it doesn't have to be re you could perhaps bypass mainstream media um we do that we do that it's uh, it's uh, you know we always look at the situation as extremely grim and uh, we have met we are proud of inventing complaining uh, so we keep complaining all the time but uh, it's good to complain it's a common trait but, you uh, have with brits uh, it's okay <laughs> uh, no, speak about, uh, Israelis complain. <laughs> shared values, <laughs> complaining. So it's uh, yeah, but we are, we are doing a very big effort. It's, uh, we ran out of money because uh, because we do a lot. It's uh, not because we do nothing. We we send delegations around the world of the hostages uh, families, and uh, we. We keep um, uh, showing the, the horrors of uh, October 7th for people to understand where we where we began. And we move from one hospital to another and to, to show what uh, is really happening in those hospitals in Gaza. And we give access to journalists and we do a lot of creative stuff on uh, social media. And uh, a lot of people in Israel, either parts of the government or people who do it, uh, volunteering to do that with their own creative uh, ideas, 
And I don't know if you had the chance to, or you should. Yossi, thank you so much for your time and for joining us on the program today. And this brings us into our third segment. What does this mean to you? I think that with Iran now being the main sponsor of this, it's not anymore an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, It's acquired regional dimensions that has potential geopolitical implications. And that's unprecedented, never happened before. Um, It was always a local conflict that made a lot of media noise. But what we see now is that um, there's increased Houthi attacks on international ships in the Babelman Strait or the Red Sea that is going to increase insurance costs, it's going to increase oil prices, um, it's going to affect trade, logistics, and while the conflict has not at all affected markets, that may in the future change as this geopolitical dimension kicks in. While you say this hasn't affected markets, markets are more volatile now more than ever in this last week. They've been up and down They're expecting the S&P to like hit an all time high and then lows. So it's I mean, I don't know if it has had a direct effect on the markets, but it certainly definitely created instability and volatility in the market. Or would you disagree with that? I don't think it's affected um, the markets at all. I think that the volatility in in markets of, you know, has more to do with the U.S. Fed than it has to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. At the moment now, there's a divergence between security and financial markets. The danger becomes when they become aligned with one another. Um, At the moment now, they tend to be at odds with one another. And then we move into our last segment, which is Barack's favorite topic of who are the Godfather characters in this scenario. And I have to thank you, actually, because you helped me win a bet the other day. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, that famous line from Godfather 3, just when I thought they, they just when I thought they, uh, just when I thought, uh, yeah, uh, just when I, uh, no, I'm, what do you want from me? Okay. Do you know what I mean? I'm not even seeing Godfather 3, but you mentioned it on our previous episode of saying, just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. Nice. And somebody tried to tell me that that was Al Pacino and Scarface. No. Right. And I was like, no way. That's the Godfather 3. I know this unequivocally because the biggest super fanboy Godfather person on the planet, Barack, has, we've just discussed this in the podcast. And I was like, the line you're thinking of is say hello to my little friends. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, but I just wanted to throw that out there and say thank you for helping me nice. win a bet. Nice. Anyway, do carry on with this fascinating segment of the Godfather characters are, by all means. Look, this was addressing Yossi Kupawas's point of how um, Israel sort of did a few raids going into Gaza, coming out of Gaza multiple times, and each time sending more forces, extending the range of targets um, in order that Hamas wouldn't be able to identify um, a single incursion And um, that very much reminds me of kind of the stealthy, silent rise of Michael Corleone. He was the civilian that actually then increased his lethality over time. And that's what I see here in this conflict. So very much it is Michael Corleone's mode of stealth. Do you know every time you do this segment, I just literally sit here and think you have so much spare time on your hands to think (laughs) <laughs> think about this. I don't. It, I actually have no spare time. It's just in continual replay in my mind. You sad, sad man. I... You're not. I'm just enlightened. <laughs> I'm enlightened. You know, some, at some point, I, I will watch it. You. I want to inspire you not to win bets, but to watch the thing. Well, maybe one day, as they say, God willing, that will happen. But let's see. I wouldn't hold your breath, Brock. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, that's it for us today. Please make sure to tune in next week for our episode on the war in Israel, part three, the Islamist dimension to the conflict, how radicalization affects the day after in Gaza, 
with special guest Dr. Iran Lerman, former Deputy Director for Foreign Policy and International Affairs at the Israeli National Security Council, and what this means for global economies and its everyday impact on you. The Geo Godfather Wars is an Electric Cast production. Our executive producers are Leah Tedrow, Barack Siner, Mark Netter, and Peter Rafelson. If you like our podcast, please rate, review, and tell your friends and colleagues to listen in. Have you ever wondered what actually happens in Congress every day? Stay informed on Capitol Hill's daily happenings with a concise, factual summary of the Senate and House of Representatives' activities from the previous session, free from bias, on the Congressional Record Daily Digest podcast. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and discover the process from the heart of U.S. politics. The Congressional Record Daily Digest, an Electric Cast production. Welcome to Transforming 45, the podcast that celebrates the incredible power of passionate voices. I'm your host, Lisa Boat. Join me in conversation with heart-led humans who share their deeply personal stories of transformation. Transforming 45 is here to uplift, connect, and remind you that it's never too late to write your next chapter. So get ready to be inspired, empowered, and transformed. Join me in this community where through powerful storytelling, we heal and reclaim our inherent magic. Electric acid.